Colleges and universities across the country are asking the same question. What is our true role in the 21st century? The role of the university has got to be to prepare our students to enter a very complex society and fully capable of understanding it and making changes in it. It's clear more than ever that before students enter that complex society, they will need a comprehensive understanding of the environmental issues facing our world. The University of Washington knows this. For the past century, it has been a catalyst for developing sustainable strategies and promoting environmental change. In our curriculum, and all the teaching we do, there's a theme that runs through it, and that is how are we going to sustain the planet? Sustainability. How do we go about teaching such a sweeping and all-encompassing subject? Join us as we uncover how the University of Washington is preparing its students to be good stewards of the planet. We visit the Bothell Wetlands and the Center for Sustainable Forestry in Pat Forest, two programs in Western Washington that offer students real in-the-field experiences. You'd have to extract energy from someplace. We learn how the College of the Environment is cultivating young minds to tackle the environmental challenges of the future. And we discover how a program initiated and run by students is changing behavior on campus. We have students that are raising their own vegetables in an urban setting and they're actually being used by our food services. Um, I mean, that's just absolutely tremendous. I actually don't see that. Teaching and modeling sustainability for the 21st century. It is a daunting task. The University of Washington is meeting the challenge by molding the environmental leaders of tomorrow in a climate of change. Okay, so tell me what you guys see here. What did you observe? On a chilly rain-drenched morning, senior lecturer Rob Turner is teaching his students how to properly assess the effectiveness of the newly restored wetlands on Lower North Creek right next to the UW Bothell campus, three miles east of the northern tip of Lake Washington. Well, I want them to hone their observational skills and to look at the landscape and see you know, what's going on here, what's not natural. <laughs> it didn't take long for Turner and his students to find some real problem areas. You can see behind us this tiny little pond. And what it does is it captures runoff that is brought here in a series of storm sewers, catch basins and pipes. It's a rather small little pond and it can't really accommodate the volumes of flow we get during rain events. Though it is too small, the pond serves as an open laboratory for students at UW Bothell to learn how these ecosystems work. It's 58 and a half acres of restored floodplain wetland. Um, it's uh, a habitat gem within a uh, an area that's rapidly urbanizing. Warren Gold, associate professor in the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences, says the Bothell wetlands are unique because they're surrounded by an urban area that's rapidly growing. It wasn't always like this. Most of our wetlands in the region naturally were forested wetlands, and so you could think of like a cedar swamp big towering western red cedar trees and skunk cabbage and a very sort of primeval feeling, lots of mucky soils. European settlers quickly changed all that in the late 1800s. What people did is they moved up North Creek Valley and they logged, they removed a lot of the timber. As the timber was removed, they needed to get it to the sawmills and those were on the shores of Lake Washington. They straightened out the stream um, so they really altered North Creek, and as they straightened the stream out and put big dikes around it, that dried this area out a little bit. When they were finished logging, settlers turned the valley into pastures for cattle, and it remained prime grazing land for most of the 20th century. But in 1995, the state of Washington purchased 122 acres 
to build a new campus for the University of Washington in Bothell. But in order to build the buildings, they actually had to fill wetlands that were on the slopes there, what we call hill slope wetlands, springs that pop out of the side. And to make up for destroying wetlands, legally you have to do something, you have to mitigate. And the state actually had funds and thought this was a tremendous opportunity to restore not just five or six acres to make up for what they were filling on the hillside, but to actually restore a fully functioning floodplain ecosystem down here, 58 acres. Restoration of the 58 acres began in 1998 with the construction of a new stream channel system that returned North Creek to a more natural state. What we're trying to do is to restore what we call ecological function here. And that is an ecosystem that provides habitat, that cleans water, that mitigates against floods. Today, the Bothell Wetlands ranks among the largest floodplain restoration projects in the Pacific Northwest. Warren Gold appreciates the end results. Wetlands are tremendous kidneys. They clean water. They regulate against floods. They provide areas for people to come out and recharge and study nature. But restoration of the 58 acres is far from complete. So things are not quite working as planned here. It's not exactly doing what it's supposed to do. Rob Turner intentionally brought his students to this pond today because water is failing to flow out of it and into another pond, as it was designed to do. Every year, including now, a lot of the water, maybe most of it, is seeping through the hillside. So it's leaky. Um, and discharging directly into the creek here. And it's undermining the slope. The beauty of the undermined slope is that it gives students practical experience in restoring and redesigning landscapes, so they'll be better prepared to protect biodiversity when they graduate. I'm interested in uh, water quality issues, particularly toward fisheries and uh, wildlife. I do restoration work up the road in a forest, and so it's watershed restoration as well. It's wetlands just a part of it. It's a continuation of it. Well, there are a lot of jobs in environmental um, related stuff in this area and I've been thinking that um, I'd like to move into the water management area where there are a lot of upcoming jobs and there's going to be opportunities there so knowing things about it would be helpful. Giving students on the ground access to real environmental challenges outside the classroom. Warren Gold believes this is critical if we are to move forward in a sustainable way. How can we maintain a certain degree of natural function in our ecosystems in areas where we are living, right where we're living? And that's a great challenge, and we have the capability to do that in places like this here. And a change in either of these is called a radiative forcing. Across departments and programs, public policy, arts and sciences, education, business and engineering, the challenges of sustainability are being met at the UW by connecting some of the best educators and researchers in the country with students interested in nurturing a healthy planet. No school facilitates this synergy more than the College of the Environment. The college is a world-class environmental hub that focuses on improving understanding of the interactions between the Earth's environment and human activities. There are similar colleges, none of them have the breadth and the depth that we do. Lisa Gromlich, Dean of the College of the Environment, says sustainability becomes reality when organizations meet three goals. They preserve and conserve the integrity of the environment, they are economically viable, and they are increase social access and justice. The College of the Environment is ensuring that by offering an elaborate curriculum like no other school in the country. We have 450 different classes students could take. That's in nine undergraduate and 13 graduate degree programs. Basically, a student has the ability to do anything. They can work with experts in the field to be on the cutting edge of science. 
Lisa Gromlich says exposing students to tangible, real-life lessons and experiments outside of the classroom is critical in their development. And we are very blessed by having some facilities that students can access where we're actually doing the real work of sustainability. Perhaps the best example is the Center for Sustainable Forestry at Pack Forest. Located near Eatonville in the shadow of Mount Rainier, the center has been a champion of sustainable forestry for nearly 90 years. Pack Forest has been here uh, since the land was acquired in 1926 from a gift from Charles Lather Pack, who is an East Coast timberman. Um, who gave a gift to the university to buy the land. Professor Greg Edel, director of Pack Forest, says the gift in 1926 enabled the UW to purchase 334 acres of forest land. They purposely put the land, purchased land along the highway, the mountain highway going to Mount Rainier, so that when people would travel by, they would stop and see what forestry was all about. But Pack Forest is more than a tourist attraction. Today, it's been expanded to a 4,300-acre forested classroom for students, faculty, and affiliates. So we are a working forest. We're a sustainable forest. Um, we're not just demonstrating sustainable practices. We're actually living them or practicing them on the land. Trees are not only studied, they are planted, harvested and sold in a sustainable way. All profits are pumped back into the center. That is a revenue that comes from the forest, um, from timber harvest, goes to the forest to maintain the buildings, maintain the staff, help support student programs. Um, so very, very little is wasted. Travel the entire 4,300 acres of Pack Forest and you'll find a wide range of forest types, sites, soils, and operating features. So this stand used to have cedar in it. When it burned in the 20s, they salvage logged it, planted it back out with Douglas fir. At the time, that was the new forest, uh, forestry activity of, of the day. It was the, the new wave. Um, but the stand had lost its cedar component, so we've put that back in. And by maintaining the overstory structure, the idea is that as this new stand comes up underneath, we'll have a two-layer uh, canopy with the mature overstory being uh, important for a lot of uh, wildlife species that require these uh, more big branched uh, nesting platforms. The experiments and lessons learned are endless here in this working forest. We stopped here to look at the difference between an intensively planted clear cut and a, a more naturally regenerated stand. Both stands were planted at the same time about 20 years ago. The densely planted stand is designed to produce as much timber as possible. So what you end up with in a relatively short period of time is a highly productive stand. But if you look in the understory you can see that it's pretty depauperate or sparse in terms of ground vegetation. That is, there's not as much light coming to the understory here as there will be when we look in the stand out in the other unit. Really good for production forestry, but not as good for wildlife. In the adjacent unit, less than 100 yards away, more space was intentionally left between Douglas fir trees when they were planted. You'll find more hardwoods here, more diversity, but less timber suitable for harvest. This is definitely a lot uh, messier in terms of not clean planted rows. So the production here is not nearly as good as it is over there, but you might've just heard that bird. Usually there's a lot more birds out here. Um, and from a wildlife perspective, this is quite a bit more diverse of a stand. Some may argue that this stand is a classic example of a wasted resource, that thousands of dollars in potential timber revenue has been squandered by the so-called messier design. But Greg Edel says there's more at stake here than timber profits. There's no substitute for the on the ground demonstration. So, you know, we're a working laboratory. We can come and see things and we can manipulate the stands and look at what the results are. Some of the work we do is more basic research. 
and the students that are working here have an opportunity to be involved in all aspects of forest management and sustainability. For Julie Baruti, a second year master's student in the School of Environmental and Forest Sciences, the on the ground opportunities are invaluable. I used to work for a terrific conservation organization called the Rainforest Alliance and um, we worked a lot with sustainable land management and I always understood what that meant in theory and understood the principles of sustainability in theory but having worked at Pack Forest as a research assistant has really helped me understand how you implement land management that is uh, responsible and helps ensure that resources are there for future generations. Today, Julie is finishing the planting of an elder stand. Someday after she graduates, she hopes to apply what she learns here to restore and manage forests in developing countries. But it will always inform the way that I manage projects and help organizations um, build programs that do sustainable land management worldwide. That's the ultimate goal immersing students in the concepts of sustainable forestry. The point is to, to give this, the uh, students research opportunities and so depending on whether you're interested in the environment you have one perspective here whether you're interested in, in production you have a very can have a very different perspective um, and that allows us as, as a, the Center for Sustainable Forestry to talk about this site in many different ways. Um, for different people, and so there is quite a bit to be learned here. Uncovering problems, discovering innovative solutions. The University of Washington believes sustainability is in our nature. It's happening at Pack Forest, in the Bothell wetlands, even on the main Seattle campus. The role of the university has got to be to prepare our students to enter a very complex society and fully capable of understanding it and making changes in it. And that battery had electricity in it and that electricity was used to run machinery. To UW professor Bruce Ballack has been teaching astronomy for 38 years, but he has something to say about sustainability here on Earth. So as an astronomer, I take the cosmic view of, of sustainability. And, and I can imagine that 200 years from now, humanity will be the stewards of the entire solar system, every single planet and all of their moons. And when you take a look at what we've done here on the planet, this planet, that becomes scary. So what do we learn about sustainability? As I tell the undergraduates that I teach, 20 years from now, I'm gonna be worm food. And they're gonna be at the peaks of their careers the influence they have, the way in which they, they steward the resources of this planet is really of great concern to all of us, especially them. So providing them with opportunities here on the campus or making it easy for them to seize their own opportunities is very important and we do a good job of that. Are you a student here at University of Washington? Uh, yeah. Seizing opportunities. That ideal was put to the test in 2009 when a group of UW students created the Campus Sustainability Fund, or CSF. <laughs> they managed to convince both administrators and the student body to put together a fund that would support a cornucopia of sustainable projects on campus. Students came up with this idea. It was entirely a student-run decision. Jamie Rowe wasn't part of the initial campaign, but today at Husky Fest in Red Square, she's spreading the word about CSF and how students made it happen. They led the campaign, they garnered the support, they ran a, a campaign of collecting signatures, they took it to the Board of Regents, they, they really convinced all of the administration, staff, and students that this was something that we really wanted to have to kind of create a lasting sustainability impact on campus. Every year, the UW Student Services and Activities Fee Committee allocates around $340,000 to the Environmental Stewardship and Sustainability Office to help implement CSF. So every time a student pays tuition, a couple dollars go into our fund. And we fund sustainability projects all around campus. We've been running for three years now and we've rewarded over $600,000 in projects. 
CSF helped sponsor the Biodiversity Green Wall at Gould Hall. Students transformed a blank concrete wall into a showcase of improved habitat where native plants can grow and rainwater can be collected. On the main campus, there are several bicycle repair stations to help students change flat tires. We got all the common tools you need to work on a bike here. Robin Fay, chair of the CSF committee, says the bike repair stations were placed in several spots on campus to encourage students to get out of their cars and onto their bikes. You can work on it easily, you know, flipping it upside down and having to work on it upside down. You've got tools hanging here and a pump with air, so you've got everything you need to work on it, fix a flat. The idea behind the project was that it would lower some of the barriers to uh, riding your bike to campus, allow more people to commute by bike with peace of mind, knowing that if they get here and they get a flat or something goes wrong, they're gonna be able to fix it easily with the tools they need. One of the campus sustainability fund's biggest accomplishments is the establishment of the UW Farm. There are now two locations, the original site near the Botany Greenhouses on the Burt Gilman Trail, and the other just north of Husky Stadium near the Center for Urban Horticulture. The lettuce that Elizabeth and I are planting, that'll probably be eaten by students in a month or so, or a couple months, as long as the frost don't get it. Rachel Stubbs is a student volunteering at the UW Farm. She says she's proud to be part of the work being done here because she and other volunteers are learning how to produce healthy food in a sustainable way. We're selling it um, and then it ends up in, in students' food. Having this food go directly from this site to the dining hall is, uh, really lowers the carbon footprint um, and it's all done organically. This all came from the UW farm. It's a wonderful product. From the very beginning, students learn and practice sustainable farming methods. Every time we plant anything here um, that's going to take nutrients out of the soil, like your corn, soy, whatever um, factory farms food does, we try to put something back. This soil out here is actually really good for root vegetables. It's very sandy, so we get a lot of good carrots and beets. And then we also just do a lot of leafy greens because it's the Pacific Northwest and it's easy to grow leafy greens around here, so much rain. Uh, so spinach and chard, kale, tatsoi, bok choy. So this is a chioga beet. Rachel has no intention of becoming a full-time farmer. She plans on becoming a science teacher when she graduates. But she believes the lessons learned here on the farm will stay with her the rest of her life. As a student, I'm learning about how to grow food so that more of my food can be local. The more people who just know those basic skills, the more we'll be empowered as we realize that we need to change what we're doing to better our planet. We'll know how because we'll be able to do things like just grow some of our own food and decrease our carbon footprint. This is one of our projects that is going to be built soon. It is that type of thinking that the UW wants to cultivate among its students. What I love about the Campus Sustainability Fund is the way it motivates students to get involved, to become active members of the world around them. It doesn't matter that much what they do. It's the experience of having accomplished change in their world. Now just imagine this. This is the first time in their lives that students have grabbed a subject, turned it into a project, take it all the way through the steps of developing a work plan and a budget and then they compete for funding with other students. What a, what a life skill. When we think of sustainability, sophisticated smart grids, massive recycling projects, and earth-friendly farming techniques come to mind. But in truth, sustainability has everything to do with changing our behavior and our habits. One of the things we know that's critical to behavior change is awareness. Anamari Kause, provost at the University of Washington, says instilling these ideas into young minds before they enter the complex world that's waiting for them will pay dividends in the future. And I think that what we have now is much more an awareness. Um, and we can make some minor changes that aren't even particularly costly. Just the first change is important. And I think that when I see our students 
partly because they grew up so much more with this mindset. Um, they never got into some of the um, habits that, that our generation got into, and that's fabulous, and that's part of how we're learning from them. What are we really learning from them? Next on Climate of Change, we explore why the University of Washington has become one of the most sustainable planet-minded universities in the U.S. today. We learn about the Climate Action Plan that's pointing the way to a cleaner and greener tomorrow. And our hope is to become climate neutral by 2050. That's basically what we had to do. Extensive on-campus recycling, eco-friendly transportation programs, green residence halls, energy efficient monitoring devices, smart grids. They are all happening right now on the UW campus. If we go back to 1995 when we really started the energy conservation program in earnest, we're avoiding spending upwards of around $75 million. So these savings are significant. Plus, what's green about the newly renovated Husky Stadium? The strategy for our stadium was to use as many local products as possible. You know, the, all the materials, the steel was put together in Portland, Oregon, so it didn't come from overseas. We have a lot of our materials are, are right in the Puget Sound area. All this and more on the next Climate of Change.